I'm Nikki Jobbikit from Lookup Strata, and for today's ACT webinar, we're delighted to welcome a panel of ACT Strata specialists. We have Jan Brown and Steve Weeb from Bridge Strata and Nicole Robb from Signature Strata. This ACT webinar is about owners, corporation governance and meetings. It's up to the Strata manager with assistance from the chairperson to make sure meetings run efficiently. Having a well-structured agenda and a pre-meeting with the committee to ensure you're all on the same page is essential. Take the AGM, for example, the meeting's purpose is to make decisions to manage and maintain the complex over the next 12 months. Panelists today will be speaking on this topic for the first part of the webinar, and this will be followed by some discussions and Q&As. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that the information contained in the session, including any discussions that arise from submitted questions and also in chat, is not legal advice and should not be relied upon as legal advice. You should seek independent advice before acting on the information contained in the session. We thank Jan, Steve and, uh, from Bridge Strata and Nicole from Signature Strata for joining us today. Jan Brown is Director at Bridge Strata. Jan manages both ACT and New South Wales schemes. She's well known in the Strata industry as a long-term player with exceptional commitment and a strong work ethic. Jan is a previous SCA ACT board member and has been a recipient of numerous industry awards and is a qualified SCA trainer for the A100 course and more recently executive committee training. Steve Weeb is Senior Strata Manager at Bridge Strata. With over 13 years of experience within the strata industry, Steve has a wealth of knowledge of strata across ACT, New South Wales and Victoria, having spent considerable time managing complexes throughout these states. Steve has served as the treasurer for the Strata Communities Australia ACT branch and is also a nationally accredited and recognised trainer of the A100 Introduction to Strata course for SCA. Steve has a strong focus on developing a good rapport and strong relationships with his clients. Nicole Robb is Executive Strata Manager at Signature Strata. Nicole has had 12 years of experience in ACT strata management. Nicole's determined to ensure clients feel understood, supported and educated throughout any process while remaining respectful of industry and owners corporation governance. A former member of the SCA ACT board, Nicole is committed to industry improvement and enhancing the general strata experience. We thank Jan, Steve and Nicole for being contributors and supporting Look Up Strata. All three of you assist our ACT owners with their Strata questions and everyone here has joined me for a webinar in the past, although not all the same webinar. Jan and Steve joined me for an ACT Ask Us Anything session around the middle of 2021 and Nicole was one of the panellists on our Would You Make a Good Strata Manager session with SCA a few months ago. So we'd like to welcome you all back to today's session. It's really great to have you back with us again today. Thanks, Jan, Steve and Nicole. Thank you. Thanks, Nikki. Right, so basically to start off, I'll start the introductions and everything. So uh, this morning, when we talk about owners' corporations, we could refer to it as unit plans, owners' corporations, OCs, or the strata. So we are referring to the owners' corporation as a group. Also with executive committees, we, we may also shorten that down. We are in ACT, so we all do like our acronyms. We may reduce that down to the EC and also rules. So rules we are referring to should be the registered rules, house rules or house guidelines are, are no longer registered. For everyone, we are all aware that there are three different types of communities of, of owners corporations, that being community title, unit plans, which is the, the general one that everyone's aware of, um, and company shares. Company shares we have very few of. Community title, they're starting to become more and more prevalent, but the unit plan and for the owners corporation is what we're talking about today. So moving on to what is governance? Governance allows or refers to structure and processes that are designed to ensure accountability, transparency, responsiveness, rule of law, stability, equity, and inclusiveness, empowerment, and broad-based participation. The term good governance is generally, is frequently used. Good governance means providing essential services in an ethical and professional manner that will lead to effective and efficient delivery of service. There is good governance when an owner's corporation have practices and procedures in place that help them. I'm sorry, my phone's also ringing. So, <laughs> um, roll of a strata manager, the phone never stops ringing. Um, so, yeah, 
good governance is when owners corporations have practices and procedures in place that help them do their work effectively and openly and when the roles and responsibilities of people within the owners corporation are clearly understood such as the executive committee chairperson treasurer secretary communications officer subcommittees things like that but of course good governance is more than the rules of your owners corporation and in individual behaviors of your committee members it involves strong relationships between stakeholders and is more about working as a collective rather than about individual responsibilities. Why do we need good governance? Basically, it's there to protect, enhance, maintain, preserve and develop the common property of the owner's corporation, thereby adding value to your investment. Units plan is managed, generally a lot of us will have body corporate managers such as ourselves or owner's corporation managers such as ourselves. Um, so we're there to assist the owners corporation in their governance and the legislative framework. So it may be assisted in the management of the scheme by an executive committee, as I was saying, a strata manager, managing agent or a building manager. Now, for those of you who are in big owners corporations, uh, say 200 upwards, could be even, even less. I would be recommending getting a building manager rather than just having a strata manager who's not on site. A building manager is generally on site to assist and help run the owners corporation. That's a lot easier for everyone involved, in this, especially for the executive committee. So, um, was there anything else on that? No. All right. So, the legislative framework refers to legal obligations and authority. Owners corporations derive their basic legal obligations from federal, state, law, federal, state, and local statutes, regulations, and case or common law. Legal documents unique to the strata that binds the owners corporation. Now, this could be your management statements, your rules, planning agreements, any easements, especially in the case of um, the ACT, Form 4s and Form 5s. Uh, they are very, very big within the ACT. They tell you what you can use the owners corporation land for and also what you can use the individual units for as well so make sure you look at what what's contained in those and also your management agreement as well rules govern behavior of the owner of the owners and uh, guests and any residents within the owners corporation that your rules need to be enforceable across the board so you can't just have one rule for one person and another rule for a different person in, they need to be consistent throughout the board and in Boston. Use of common property areas to promote harmonious living. Use of individual units to promote conformity within the strata scheme. So you don't want one owners, uh, one unit being bright purple on the outside, another unit being bright pink, and then one being grey. I can imagine this one's unit would be bright pink. I thought yours would be safe. No, mine would be purple. <laughs> And that uh, rules also govern the behavior of, res of residents and also what will happen if um, owners or residents um, are issued a rule infringement notice. That's if, if you continue to break the rules, you can be issued a rule infringement notice. And I think I'm hierarchy, oh, hierarchy of documents. So everyone knows uh, the documents I was referring to before, Form 4s and Form 5s, also your registered house rules as well. Um, make sure you, whenever you change your rules, make sure you register those um, because if they're not registered, they're unenforceable. Um, so the first thing uh, in the hierarchy of documents, the first thing is the registered unit plan showing the precise location of units and common areas. If you have a building management statement, now they are becoming more and more pr uh, prevalent within the ACT as it is now a requirement of anybody corporate so sharing land or anything like that to have a building management statement in place. So make sure you, you're aware of what those are. Rules cannot conflict with the documents above in the hierarchy, above it in the hierarchy. So if you can't turn around and say an owner's corporation cannot use, oh, sorry, an individual unit cannot use their unit for, say, to, to lease it out when that's actually part of your form five or form four. And uh, obviously also resolutions cannot conflict with documents above it in the hierarchy as well. So you've got to make sure any resolutions or decisions that the owners corporation is making is in line with the documents above it in that hierarchy. All right, I might pass it over to Jane, who will take you through the next part. Okay. Good morning, everyone. 
Uh, I'll just go through my interpretation of governance and meetings. So strata management is another form of governance below local, state and federal structures and legislation. The management is similar to that of a company. So if you imagine a company, uh, they're an entity of its own, has to have an ABN, a owner's corporation also has to have an ABN and becomes an entity. The number of the plan when it's registered is their entity number. So it could be the owners of units plan number XXX, and in other states, it could be the owners of strata plan uh, or a community association or community title. Uh, basically, the management is similar. Uh, and then, like a company, you would have a board of directors. The board of directors is that of your executive committee or strata committee if you're in New South Wales or association committee or community associations. And the shareholders are the owners within that, those owners' corporations. So the board of directors are the ones that make the decisions on behalf of the owners' corporation. They're elected at a general meeting. So that's the, the way that the uh, table goes. Uh, owners' corporation, elected executive committee, the board of directors as your committee, then the strata manager is like the CEO. So they take directions from the committee. Strata care and title management um, need to comply with the relevant acts and regulations, binding the owners with those requirements for the management of the various entities noted as units, plans, and community titles. Steve spoke about a little bit about that hierarchy and how that is in place, but it includes but not limited to the below responsibilities. Financial management and accountability, accountability, management repair of common infrastructure, conducting meetings and other meet, uh, general meetings to assist with good governance in resolving financial, future budgets, repairs and maintenance, election of your committees, future planning and other relevant motions. So those AGMs, uh, where you determine your budget, insurances, elect your committee, are part of good governance and they need to happen on a regular basis. And Nicole will speak more about the structures of your committees and those meetings. One of the big things with your committee is ethics. Executive committee members, have enormous trust placed upon them, as do your strata manager and their fellow owners corporation members. An executive committee member must always discharge his or her duty in an ethical manner. And we, we do get complaints sometimes where you get uh, committee people that will go on a committee for a hidden agenda and they'll be there for 12 months, but they have a specific purpose of being on that committee. We also get concerns registered sometimes of some committee people where they have a higher uh, empowerment and they feel that they can make decisions without consulting other members of the committee. Uh, but if you are a committee person, you also have to be able to speak up and take part. It's no sense in saying, yes, I'll go on the committee and no, not partaking in email decision makings or general meeting or committee meeting decisions. You have to be active and proactive in the management of your plan. You are taking a role on and it has certain responsibilities in forming good governance of your structure. The committee ethical behaviour refers to acting with the, within the provisions of the law, following reasonable instructions, abiding by a code of conduct. There is a code of conduct for executive committees and managers within the legislation. And it's a good idea for each committee person uh, or your, each owner to be familiar with that code of conduct. You have to act in the best interest at all times of the owner's corporation. Exercise the duty of skill, care, and due diligence in all dealings. Maintain confidentiality, professionalism, and transparency. And we give you an example in that uh, a notice corporation may call for quotes for grounds maintenance. And one of the committee members might have a mate who is a grounds contractor. They get all the quotes and then they'll tell their mate how much they should come in at uh, to win the quote, to win the tender. That is non-ethical and it's not in the best interest of the owners corporation 
So it's a small example. We've seen those sort of things happen. Uh, and it is unfair for you to provide quotes provided by other tradespeople to someone that you may have an affiliation with unless you determine a conflict. You need to make sure that that conflict is always declared if there's any possible item of there. Um, the roles and responsibilities. So stakeholders involved in the management of the strata scheme. Your unit owners, your committee, subcommittees. We recommend that, especially for some of the larger plans, that you have subcommittees and you may have people within your group that don't want to go on the executive committee but are quite happy to go on a subcommittee and they have areas of expertise. So it could be painting or grounds, uh, some structural works that need to be done. So we try to have those people form subcommittees they will then assist in the roles and responsibility of the committee. So that's all part of the governance of the formation of your various committees. Uh, your office bearers, the committee should elect office bearers at their first meeting. So you need to have a chairperson, a secretary and a treasurer. The chairperson chairs the meeting, the secretary does your agendas and your minutes and the treasurer uh, keeps an eye on the financials. Those duties of the secretary and the treasurer are usually uh, delegated to your strata manager, but it is still a good idea to have someone who knows about financials that can keep an eye on the financials. Most strata managers these days have a portal and you can have access to the financials at any time and query with your strata manager uh, coding um, or if you want something that you feel should be a sinking fund expense, it's been put through as an admin expense. Again, speak to your starter manager and have a good report with them um, to make sure that your financials are in line with what, um, what needs to be done. Uh, you also have your the starter manager, the caretaker or building manager, leading agent, property manager, tenants and visitors. So within that roles and responsibility of your governance, there are a lot of different factors involved and a lot of different roles for different people to take on. A lot owner. A lot owner has responsibilities as well. You as a lot owner, you have the responsibility to make sure that your lot is maintained in good condition. Uh, you take part in your annual general meetings or general meetings, even if it's just to send a proxy back. This represents your home or an investment and or investment. So you need to take care and interest in what's happening. It's no sense in when you get a levy and find your levies have gone up um, by 20% and you think, oh, what happens? We don't see anything happening. You need to know what's in the budget, what your owner's corporation is budgeting for, and then take part or at least an interest and knowledge of what's going on. It's no sense in abusing a strata manager because the levies have gone up. Um, some owners think the strata managers have very deep pockets and we take all the money. Or we, we do not. There's always a bank account in the name of the owners corporation. In New South Wales and some other states, they're actually a trust account. In ACT, they're not trust accounts, uh, but the manager still has the control of those accounts and runs them in line and in um, consultation with the communities. A special resolutions, um, Nicole might speak on the different type of resolutions with your committees and your general meetings. Committee members, we've spoken about um, roles, responsibilities and ethics within that. Some committee members, uh, your chairperson uh, is important. Your chairperson has to chair general meetings in the ACT. In New South Wales, the manager can chair meetings. But in ACT, it's very specific that the chairperson in that role has to chair the general meetings. Strata managers tend to take um, a cooperative role and assist the chair in running those meetings. Some stratas uh, have uh, strata plans or units plans to have chairs that are very knowledgeable and very capable in the role. But in some of the small ones, especially, uh, you do get chairs that are very hesitant 
So that's the role of the strata manager as part of good governance to assist and everyone works in a cooperative manner. The secretary uh, certainly helps with the agenda. Uh, good governance uh, is that you speak and cooperate with the manager and the committee by preparing your agenda and your budget. Uh, for the larger plans, it's a good idea to have a pre-AGM meeting uh, with your strata manager and you can then do the budget together and prepare your agenda together. And then that goes, goes out to all the owners. And if it's got the cooperation and the input from the committee, then usually those budgets and the agendas go through fairly smoothly. The treasurer, as we've alluded to, keeps an eye on the financials and uh, assists the strata manager with changes to codes. So strata managers within their office have a lot of different codes for, for various items, caretaking, grounds, repairs and maintenance, plumbing, insurances. Uh, depends on how the wording is. If it's an everyday uh, maintenance, uh, it can go in under the administrative fund if there's a budgeted line item. If it becomes renewing and uh, part of the major expense, then it would normally go under the sinking fund or a capital works fund as noted in other states. So that's a, a brief summary. And I'll hand over to Nicole, who can take you through meetings, financials, record maintenance. Thanks, Jen. Hi, everyone. Hopefully you're having a really good morning. You've been bombarded with the information from these two wonderful strata managers who I will admit probably know a lot more than I do. I'm going to run you through really quickly in relation to meetings. So Steve and Jan have already set the framework, the governance of an owner's corporation or a unit's plan, the importance of certain documents, rules, Form 4s, Form 5s, the legislation from state and federal levels. And that all culminates into the meetings that the owners' corporations hold and how important those meetings are to set the owners' corporation up for the next 12 months and what they're going to be doing and also to give instruction to the executive committee as to what they will also be allowed to do during those uh, that next 12-month period. So... To start off with the types of meetings that you will have as a new owners corporation directly after registration, so a new build, you will have what's called a first annual general meeting. At this meeting, um, that's where the owners corporation will uh, set up uh, their um, base rules in terms of uh, putting together a consolidated set, so including items um, from, the default, uh, from the default rules. They'll also um, agree to the budgets going forward. They'll set up contracts. They'll put in place what I call housekeeping um, of the owners corporation. A lot of motions that you'll see in a first AGM won't pop up again things like allowing the executive committee to invest funds moving forward, um, the ability for the executive committee to engage with service contractors. Uh, these are all housekeeping motions. You see them once and then they don't need to pop up again. After that, you'll have an annual general meeting every year. It says it in the name. It will happen annually, generally around the same time each year, um, by any exceptional circumstances. And this will be somewhere in the realm of four to six weeks after the end of your financial year. At these annual general meetings, you're, place, you're putting in place your budget, um, you're advising the executive committee on works that are required to the owners corporation, uh, you are registering any rules that you need to register, you're adopting sinking fund plans, maintenance plans, uh, you're looking at insurance, defects and all of that sort of thing. Without an annual general meeting, your executive committee has no guidance as to what they're allowed to do for the next 12 months. And that budget that you put together needs to include money for items that you want the committee to do, not just your general maintenance and your standard contracts, but any upgrades um, or any special requests that the owners have put forward. 
So from there, you then have your executive committee meetings, which are the best fun. If you've never been to one, you need to come to one of mine because I generally have wine and cheese. Um, the executive committee will be looking at the items that have been approved at the annual general meeting, and they'll be going through and making the decisions on behalf of the owners corporation as to which contractors they'll engage to complete that work. So, for instance, the owners corporation might have said, we want to put up bollards on the nature strip to stop people from parking there. That's great. The, owners, the executive committee then need to source quotes. They need to get the application approved through Access Canberra, um, decide on the, the material being used for the bollards, et cetera. So an executive committee meeting will then come together with those quotes and make that decision on behalf of the owner's corporation. And they're doing that as instructed and they've got their budget for it. So with all of these meetings, you can also then have general meetings. These are meetings that um, come about either because a uh, decision needs to be made by the owner's corporation that's popped up during the year outside of the annual general meeting or at the request of an owner. So an owner can request a general meeting for a particular reason um, and the executive committee do have an obligation to host that general meeting um, to pass any motions that are required to have the discussion and to get further instructions from the owners corporation so quite a few meetings during the year but they don't all have to be stuffy and boring you can make them as fun as you want when we go through our meetings, um, there's various different uh, resolutions, as Jan noted before, that can be passed. The Owners Corporation has four resolutions, ordinary, special, unanimous, and unopposed. So ordinary resolutions, you need a majority in favor of the motion for it to pass. Special resolution, you need majority in favor and not more than a quarter of the votes against the motion for it to pass. For a unanimous resolution, you need all votes in favour of um, the uh, motion. So every single owner needs to say yes. And an unopposed resolution, you need to have all votes in favour and none against. So the difference between unanimous and unopposed, unanimous, you need all parties to vote, so all units to vote. Unopposed, it's the votes on at the meeting, as long as they are all in favour and none are opposed. Now, the different motion types are related to different types of um, resolutions that you need to make. Generally, ordinary resolutions are what we have in our AGMs on an everyday basis. Special resolutions are the things like registering your rules. And then unanimous and unopposed is where it gets tricky. And that would come down to the types of resolutions that you're requesting. Your charter manager would be able to give more information on those on an as-needs basis. Um, moving into the um, sorry, moving forward. Moving into the budget. So, um, as I said before, the budget that you set at a meeting is what's going to take you through for the following twelve months. You do need to ensure that you have a budget for all of your ongoing maintenance items, any contracts that you have in place with gardeners, cleaners, lifts, fire maintenance, garage doors, etc all need to be budgeted for and ensuring that you place in there any CPI increases that may come about and your contractors will tell you if they are increasing their prices at any stage. You also need to budget for your common utilities such as water and electricity and at the moment we are seeing an incredibly high increase in electricity prices up to 35 percent like an email from actu the other day so it's very important that owners corporations um, ensure that they uh, carry through a budget that will cover all of their expenses from there you also need to ensure that your budget contains any items that you wish for the executive committee to do throughout the year for you. So if you do want to put bollards in, you need to make sure you have a budget for it. Uh, your sinking fund is, like I, I always like to say, your sinking fund is your long-term savings account for your big assets to be replaced at a later date. So as long as you maintain an asset, it'll last, and then when it does need to be replaced, your sinking fund is where you get the money for, for those big replacements, such as your garage door motor blowing itself out after 15 years of going up and down the time. 
The accounting records that the owners corporation need to keep need to align with what you've budgeted for. So at the end of the financial year, you need to have a look at um, whether you've gone over any of your allocated budget amounts, why you've gone over it and how you need to rectify that moving forward. Generally, an administration account uh, or administrative account uh, is meant to be um, in more exact, whatever you bring in is what you're going to spend. However, it was always recommended that the owners corporation do carry some surplus through in the admin account. Whereas the sinking fund, as I said, you want to put the money into that um, so that you've got it for later dates. So that will always have uh, more of an income than an expenditure, unless you're going through a year where you do have a big expense that's going to be coming out. So in closing for myself, in terms of meetings and the governance that comes through with it, an owners corporation holds meetings to be able to provide instruction to their executive committee for the following 12 months. And to do that, they need to have a budget and they need to have resolutions. If for any reason an executive committee wants to make a decision that's outside of those instructions, it's generally a good idea to come back to a general meeting and have it discussed with all owners. But other than that, an owner's corporation is a lot of fun and an executive committee meeting can be a party as long as you bring me. <laughs> Excellent. That's a great way to finish it too, Nicole. Okay, thank you very much for that information. Obviously, for everyone that's here, there is a lot of information in that half an hour um, of speaking. So that was excellent. Thank you so much for that. We had a question that came through um, during the session from Paul. So I might just ask that, Jan, of you, and it was to do with um, subcommittees that you mentioned. So Paul's just asking how are subcommittees appointed? Well, a subcommittee, uh, we find to start the easiest way is that if you're having a major gardening upgrade or grounds upgrade, you send out notification to all the owners. Look, anyone that's interested in forming a subcommittee, uh, and sometimes you will get someone on there that has a love for grounds and will take that on. And if you can get two or three people there, they will then go off on their own little thing that the committee is saying, okay, we'll appoint these people as a subcommittee. I will point out it is a great idea to make sure that that's minuted in a committee meeting minute because if that subcommittee then say, okay, we'll do a little bit of volunteer work, under the insurance, the owners' corporation insurances, there is coverage for volunteer, volunteer workers. If it's recorded in the minutes that this subcommittee or any of the workers are going to go in and do a volunteer a working bee, then they would be covered under that volunteers work working cover if they injure themselves. So remembering that the subcommittee, while they're not appointed at an AGM or a general meeting, they are basically uh, ele not elected but appointed by your committee, they still have the roles and responsibilities of the owners corporation. So they need to have some sort of protection as far as insurance goes. They can't make decisions. They will then send recommendations back to your committee. So we have quite a few subcommittees, especially uh, I manage a lot of community associations and uh, they're covering acres and acres of ground. They have non potable water supplies. They have adjustments, um, tennis courts. Uh, so there has to be certain guidelines and rules around those areas and also long-term maintenance programs. You may have a large um, engineering job that you want to put out. So you will lead to some committee with people who knowledge have knowledge on building and then they can go through the tenders and then recommend to the committee. So there's nothing onerous in appointing a subcommittee um, and it is a great benefit and takes the pressure off the executive. Excellent, thank you. Um, okay, we've got we had a few other questions that have come through during chat, but we might just leave those for now, and um, and we'll go back to the questions that were submitted prior to the um, the session starting via email. And I believe this one uh, is from Robert. So I think Steve, you're answering this one for us. I am, yes. Okay, the question is: After being elected at an AGM with a reduced quorum, when can the EC first meet? 
Our strata manager advised that as decisions from such meetings cannot be implement, implemented for 28 days, the newly elected EC cannot meet until this period has elapsed. This seems inconsistent with the UTMA, which has no provision for individuals to be challenged, and logically the election result thus therefore stand in all circumstances provided the AGM an election has been called and run in accordance with the Act. Of course, the, newly, the new EC would be unable to implement any decisions of the AGM until 28 days have passed, but surely the EC should be able to elect office bearers and deal with routine matters immediately post the AGM. If an EC cannot operate for at least 28 days after a reduced quorum AGM, this would leave virtually every OC in the ACT without a functioning EC for a month every year. Surely this is undesirable. Further, it is a contravention, uh, is it a contravention of the Act if levy notices based on a budget proposed at an AGM with a reduced quorum are sent out to residents before the 28 day period has ended? If notices are sent out and an owner objects, who is liable? Is it the OC or the strata manager? All oh, right, let me just say it's not virtually every owner's corporation within the ACT. It is every owner's corporation within the ACT because it is very, very rare to actually get a quorum at any sort of meeting. Now, as strata managers, I'm pretty sure I speak for the rest of us here. If we get a quorum at an AC, uh, sorry, if we get a quorum at an AGM, we instantly get worried that something's not right. <laughs> so. <laughs> no, 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 so, no, I think no, that's no, just used to. Maybe just like. We do get quorums because people uh, are more likely to be um, a high ratio of. Oh, I don't think that's right. Yeah, so you pick a higher quality But the larger class A is multi story. Oh, yeah, no, a lot of them are the best stuff. I'm going to start going to the next one and show But yes, the executive committee can make within that 28 days just for general, um, everyday pet, uh, pet approval. Elect the Elect office bearers. Elect the office bearers um, and things like that. Obviously, anything that's come from the AGM. You can't you can't implement until that twenty eight day period has has run its course. In my now I did I, in my introduction I did say that I had thirteen years. I worked it out the other day. It's actually seventeen years in the industry. Um, Showing your age there, Steve. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, I'll have to update that one. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking I'm going to have to update my my bio. But in my seventeen years of actually doing this job, I've never actually seen a reduced quorum. Here, um, and it's a big challenge battle, and I, I believe you're the same. I'm the same. I think Jenny, uh, I've seen it maybe once. Yes. Yeah. So it's a very, very rare thing. Now, going on to the levy notices, for I do send those out even within the 28 day notice period, just so that because they'll become due just after that, just so that, it, that people are notified of it and they do actually get it. If there is an issue and someone does object to that, that's very, very easy within um, anyone's software that, that anyone of us uses. We can instantly cancel um, invoices if they aren't correct or if someone does object, we can instantly cancel them and it's like they, they've never actually been there. And I think you look at it for every action, there's a reaction. So what it's like work health and safety. If you don't send them out, it means people are going to be getting their levies late which then puts a financial burden on them because the next levy is going to be due very shortly afterwards. So you try to send them out and keep the levies due when they, they should be. And the reaction, it's very, very rare to get a negative reaction about sending the levies out in those 28 days. I certainly have some plans where I know that um, certain owners and stick with the legislation and we won't send the levies out until after the 28 days. So you need to read your owners corporations and um, how they want that done, and possibly to protect the strata manager, uh, which is down the bottom, you get that instruction from the committee. Okay, so can I just clarify, the concern is that the budget is not actually deemed adopted until the 28 days has right. elapsed, is that right? Okay, so that's what the concern yes. is. Yeah. So because the budget hasn't it's actually been adopted yet. Yeah. Okay, all right, that's fine. I uh, just, so just just for the flow of the for the owners corporation also so you don't have to wait for money to come in. Um, it's a lot easier for the, the those invoices or those levy notices 
to be sent to all owners as, as soon as the meeting is done, just, just to make sure you have to flow is still up and running. Okay, thanks. Yeah, just on that in quorums of the ACP, it's very difficult. It's 50% of all members. In other states, like New South Wales, it's only 25% of the financial members. So that's why it's so difficult to get a quorum. And the industry has tried to, uh, and the local industry has tried to argue that and suggest changes to the powers to be in ACT, but it's fallen on deaf ears at this stage. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, we just had a comment on that. Sorry, I was just reading that from Robert saying the UTMA makes it very difficult to overturn a reduced quorum decision, um, however it is possible. So that's what he's um, just commented on. It, it, it certainly is possible. You do need to have at least 50% of owners entitled to vote, sign a petition to actually overturn anything. As I said, in 17 years, and the Senate happened. Excellent. Also, okay. We don't get quorums at meetings, so you're not going to get 50% of people to sign. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. We had one uh, question that came in from this one's from Joanne. I'm sorry, I'm not sure who's answering this one. So, who was it? Oh, uh, okay. Yes. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Jan. So this one's from Jan. So Joanne's asking, um, I'm seeking clarification on the operational aspects of an executive committee in a strata A complex in the ACT. The committee uses a WhatsApp group to discuss issues and seek approval of expenditures. On numerous occasions, spouses or partners of the elected committee members will respond with approval or make comments in the interchange. Is this okay or should it only be elected um, members that are responding? Could the elected member provide written advice to the committee that their partner has the authority to respond on their behalf? And there's also the issue that they often respond as we, which gives the impression of two votes rather than one. I'd also like clarification on the issue of an executive committee member that owns multiple lots. Does this give them the corresponding number of votes on the executive committee or is this only relevant when they vote as a lot owner? Wonderful. Thanks, Nikki. So, and thank you, Joanne, for your question. Uh, so in relation to a committee using a WhatsApp group to discuss items, um, discussion of items is fine within that is the same as if they had email correspondence or they had an informal meeting where they met in the you know, driveway and had a chat about something. But formal decisions of um, the committee need to be made at formal committee meetings. And there are um, legislative requirements to hold an EC meeting, which is to provide an agenda to each member seven days prior to the meeting, um, including the time and date of the meeting as well. So they do need to have a proper agenda and it does need to be provided. So decisions within that WhatsApp group are probably, I would say decisions, not valid. Discussion, totally fine. When it comes to spouses or partners or somebody else responding on behalf of an elected member, unfortunately, the bottom line is those comments make no difference and are not able to be taken as valid. It is only the elected members of the executive committee that can make decisions. So it would be beneficial if the partners or, or, or spouses or someone if they want to be included, become part of the subcommittee, as Jan pointed out previously. They don't need to be elected EC members, but they may have a, a pattern for a particular project and they can come in and consult and have discussions with the EC on those particular matters, but only the elected EC members can formally make decisions on items. Um, and within that WhatsApp group, I would definitely be making sure that you're talking to the elected members um, about these items because that discussion will then be crucial to the decision being made at a formal meeting. Um, in terms of, and could the elected member provide written advice to the committee that their partner has authority? No, because you cannot hold a proxy for an EC member. So um, it is, again, just down to those elected EC members. They can't have somebody else vote on their behalf. Um, clarification on executive member that owns multiple lots. So an EC member can own multiple lots, but they still only have one vote as an EC member. It's only when it comes to a decision at a general meeting or an annual general meeting as a lot owner that they have one vote per unit. So that's the difference. As an EC member, they can hold multiple lots and still only have one vote when it comes to decision making there. 
Okay, thank you, Nicole. And that's it's great that you offered the, a few solutions in there as well as, as addressing the problem. So that's excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, we had a question that came from Elizabeth. Um, when we vote for executive committee members at our AGM, we're not given the opportunity to vote for individuals. We, If we have eight nominees or less, they are elected as a group. This deprives lot owners of the opportunity to vote for individuals who have nominated for the EC and it forces us to take the bad with the good. How do we change this so that we can count our votes for each individual that has nominated for the EC. Okay, that, that's mine. The legislation requires the number to be three to seven. If you're going to exceed the seven, you have to have a resolution to exceed that number uh, to start with. Uh, I'm not sure the size of the complex and why you need that many members on the committee. Uh, it, it gets quite onerous if you have a lot of members on the committee because you've then got to maintain a quorum. So if you've got, um, say, seven on the committee, four is a quorum. So even for an executive committee meeting, you have to have four people turn up. If you've got eight, then it's outside the, well, it's outside the requirement with the seven, but it would be a lot of members and your meeting's going to take quite a long time. If you send out, asking input on the emails, you're going to have so much email traffic, and I'm sure the strata manager doesn't want to be part of all that email traffic, so you would, should elect a representative to deal with the committee. One way around this is you declare that there is to be a ballot. So you determine the number of uh, committee people first, and if you decide that that's going to be seven, then, and there are eight or nine nominees, you need to go to a ballot. Uh, the meeting will need to appoint scrutineers and then they will then take the ballot papers and they will add up and count up how many votes each nominee gets and then that is how your executive committee gets selected in cases when there is dispute. Uh, also, if an owner sells during the year and that number is determined at seven and they've sold and you're down to six, you still have to maintain the number at seven. So you still need four for a quorum, even though there are only six members. And you open up the cash flow vacancy. Yes. Well. So the committee can then appoint someone to fill that vacancy uh, at, at, at any time. So you need to be very careful that if someone sells or passes away, their position is as Nicole said, a casual vacancy, but that number still counts towards your quorum. So I can see where it sounds like in this owners corporation, there is a group of people that seem to be re-elected each year. Uh, you need them to get the support of other members and possibly have a, um, a ballot uh, for the voting. It's like any election, we spoke about hierarchy and governance. So the strata is forms one part of government, uh, it then goes into local government, local government goes into state government, and that goes into federal. So if you don't like what my federal member's doing and that you go to election, you vote in your member in. So unfortunately, it comes down to majority vote. There's also the option that I've seen in other owners' corporations where they've done free um, nominations for the EC. So people need to actually be nominated and seconded to be elected onto the executive committee. And then at the meeting, the meeting votes for the, the nominated members um, to be elected to the executive committee. Um, if there is an issue with the EC members that have been elected, do you think that they may have nefarious intentions or their own agenda and maybe stalling some work from being done or anything to that effect, have a discussion with your strata manager and they can provide you with options on how to move forward with that. So, um, yeah, th there are options out there for you. And, and I like the last comment. Um, that's one of the comments that I usually make. The best number for an EC is one. There's no one to argue with. So, <laughs> yes, yeah, definitely. I don't think you can argue with yourself. Yeah. Well. And your various personalities. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, that's excellent. And um, good advice about the strata manager. I'm sure strata managers have usually seen this uh, situation or the situation that's happening in the committee somewhere else, and they're, they've got uh, ways that they can help you solve that. So that's good. Wonderful. All right, thank you. Uh, and we had one from Carolina, and this one was our complex has... Uh, eight lots at our, large, at, at our last AGM, there were no proxy forms completed for four joint lot owners. One of the joint owners nominated herself to be a Council of Owners member and was voted in. Since she had no signed proxy, is her Council of Owners membership valid? If I'm correct, we now have two council members and uh, strata law says there must be three to seven. Um, I was nominated, although not voted onto the the council in three of the last AGMs, as we do not meet the required number of members, can I step in as a member? No worries. So thank you for the question. Um, in a complex of eight lots, so another requirement of the Unit Title Management Act is that you do not have more executive committee members than an ordinary owner. So for this particular instance of eight lots means that you would need to cap your executive committee members at to be able to still have the, um, the, uh, the required number of ordinary owners um, versus committee members. So if we go with that, that you need three executive committee members and the absolute minimum for the ACT is three, um, then if you only have two elected members, you do not have a valid executive committee to run. Um, in terms of a lot owner having, um, I'm just trying to work that out, completed for four joint lot owners. So if there are four owners of one lot, they need to fill in an owner's representative form to say that this particular owner is the representative for all owners of this lot. Um, they then don't need a proxy for a meeting because they're still an owner, so they're still able to vote. So um, there are differences between an owner's representative and, um, and the proxy at a meeting. Uh, it's the same um, or similar to company-owned units. A company-owned unit must appoint a representative, and that representative is the person that can come to the meeting and vote on behalf of that lot. They don't need a proxy, but they need to be the nominated representative, and that is noted in the TMA. Um, and... If the person, so Carolina saying that she's nominated but not voted into, um, it depends on what's been happening at that meeting. If a ballot vote, like Janet described earlier, was done, um, then, you know, obviously people have voted. But if there's uh, meant to be uh, obviously three uh, members on the uh, executive committee and there's now only two, that means that there is a casual vacancy that can be filled by an owner nominating. Okay, thanks so much, Nicole. Um, and we just have one other question that we had that was sent in. Uh, so we might just cover that quickly. Uh, so it mentions so financial statements usually have separate columns for actuals and budget numbers on the same page. If the financial statements are being approved, does this mean that the whole page is being approved and not just the columns for the actuals? And if so, why is it not appropriate to discuss the actuals as well as the budget at the same time? Uh, it's certainly not ideal. There is various agenda items. The first agenda item is that financials for the end of financial year be confirmed or accepted. And that is what you're discussing. You're not discussing the budget going forward because in between the financial agenda item and the budget item, there may be resolutions for future works that will impact your budget. So you only deal with the financials for the previous 12 months. And managers do try to send out uh, the financials so they're giving as much information as possible. And it will have what you've actually spent this year, what you budgeted that previous year, and then they'll have a comparison for the budget going forward. But we will go around in circles if you're trying to discuss the budget for the following year under your financials. Your financials is only for that financial year end. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. So Josephine had asked, would you please comment on payments made to committee members, their companies and individual owners without um, presentation of an invoice at a committee meeting or any minute authorising payment? 
Um, yeah. I'd love to jump on on this because I've actually got a very recent example. Um, so basically, an executive committee member may incur expenses in, in their position, and if it's approved and if there is a budget for it, that executive committee member can be reimbursed by the owners' corporation. So some OCs will have a slush fund, a miscellaneous line item, a few hundred dollars. The EC might need to. Uh, by paper to print out newsletters to drop to everyone, or they might have gone and bought a new garden hose for the bin room, something like that. As long as there's a receipt that um, they can present then, and there's a budget for it, the, the Otis Corporation will reimburse that executive committee member for an actual expense that they have incurred in their duties. When it comes to payment, as in paying uh, for a job that's been performed, the executive committee are volunteer members. They are not in that role to be paid for their services. However, there has been instances in the past of EC members being paid an honorarium, which I had never heard of before and only just recently come across. And the way that it was presented to the owners corporation was that the particular committee member had put in so much work um, over and above what they were required to do, and they were requesting to be paid for the hours of service that they had, been, had put into the Otis Corporation. The Otis Corporation can pass a motion that that be, um, that be agreed to, and a budget item can be allocated to that. However, it is not the usual practice, and it is definitely something that um, when I came across it, I was very surprised that it had even been approved in the first place. Um, so reimbursement for an actual expense that's been incurred by an EC member in their duties, again, paper, um, garden hose, or they um, went to an EC training course, um, then absolutely we, we um, their own corporation should reimburse EC members, but payment for the job being done um, is not something that I would necessarily uh, agree to. Okay, oh, to follow up on that, um, and I suppose a little bit different, I had quite a few plans where they have honorariums. Yeah. Um, is that from New South Wales or? Mainly community associations. Yeah. They do water meter readings. Um, they perform duties. They do mowing on verges and things like that. But it, as Nicole has said, it's a line item in the budget and they have to approve the honorarium for the previous 12 months, not 12 months in advance. So if you approve one going forward and they don't do the work, then you're stuck on an iceberg, so to speak. <laughs> so it's what the the meeting determines what that honorarium will be as what they've done and contributed in the previous 12 months. Okay, wonderful. Did you have anything to say, to say on that, Steve? I agree with them. I have seen it before, um, but I have mainly seen, for, uh, for instance, uh, recently I had a committee member actually take stuff that dumped items from the bin room to the tip. They got a receipt for the for the tip fees and we just reimbursed them. So yes, I agree with the ladies. Excellent. Okay, wonderful. Uh, the question from Robert was, can you raise your hand on the night for a position on the executive committee? I think the UTMA is silent on that matter. All yeah. three of us are nodding our heads. Yes, okay. <laughs> okay, so that's an Jen easy one. Generally, yes. Uh, some owners' corporations will send out nomination forms uh, about six weeks prior to the AGM, so that they so that names can be included in the agenda. But that doesn't preclude someone from at the AGM on the night of the AGM going, "Yes, I would like to actually go on this one to the AC as well." Okay, great. And we had one from Paul, which was a follow-up question regarding quorums at an EC meeting. We only had six members elected at the AGM and then had a retirement down to five, no casual vacancy nominees. Um, what's our quorum figure? Four. Okay. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, it's always a majority. It's always a majority. So we do, even in the executive committee, if you have, I, I hate executive committees that have even numbers. Yeah. Because... Whether you've got six, five or six, so six or seven, you're still going to need four. Mm -hmm. So always make sure you've got an odd number. So much better with an odd number. Yeah, and also it means that if you've got a majority vote thing. So otherwise, if you've got an even number, you could have three yeses and three noes. 
So it's nice to have one there. All right, wonderful. Well, I think that takes us up to the hour as well. Um, of course, there's always lots more to talk about, but I think we've covered so much information today. Um, so we're really keen to get this processed and out to everybody this afternoon. So please, everyone that's been here today, um, if you can share it with your committees, um, if you're the only person that's um, that's attended today um, from your committee, take it back to your committee, um, get everyone to watch it. I'm sure it'll just make things run a lot more smoothly in your building. All right, thank you so much. And we'll see you um, in the next session. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for joining us for this educational session. If you gained value from the information, please like this video. You can also engage further with Look Up Strata by subscribing to our YouTube channel or by being kept informed about Strata News via our regular newsletters. Our subscribe link is listed in the description box below.